Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast, where we introduce you to a world of small to medium business acquisitions and mergers. We interview business owners, industry leaders, authors, mentors, and other influencers with the sole intent to share with you what it looks like to buy or sell a business. Let's get rolling. Welcome. I'm here today with Joshua Johnston. I get that right? I say it right? You got it perfect. Awesome. It's from 321 Ops. Is that, is that right? Yeah, uh, 321 Pocket Ops. Yeah. 321 Pocket Ops. I, I'm going to be a whole, uh, wholly transparent. We spent the last 10 minutes, actually, wow, 25 minutes trying to get the, the, uh, the equipment running. So if you guys see we're in a different setting and stuff, we're actually in the podcast studio, which I've never used. <laughs> we have it. We own it. We just never use it. I do, my, I do these for my office. And I don't have any of my show notes. So uh, let's just jump right in and uh, just be organic here because that's kind of yeah. how the day is going for me. So Joshua, t- tell us kind of who you are, um, where you're from, kind of, uh, I noticed some of this cool stuff in your, I've looked through your, uh, I mean, I kind of creeped you, right? I, I crawled through your Facebook, I crawled through your LinkedIn, uh, yeah. so you be a CrossFit instructor and uh, there's some, yeah. some uh, articles or some things on LinkedIn that pop up that look like you might do some mountain climbing or, or art, wrote about climbing Mount Everest and stuff. You yeah. seem like a really cool guy. So t- tell us, tell us about yourself, real. Let's just yeah, start right there. yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So, um, you know, I uh, born and raised in in Michigan, um, from Ann Arbor originally. So big, big U of M fan, um, and ended up uh, moving to the west side of Michigan to Grand Rapids for for school. Uh, got my exercise science degree, uh, and as uh, anyone with an exercise science degree, you quickly find out that uh, you stop using your exercise science degree three to four years after (laughs) being in that field. So uh, quickly transitioned out of, uh, out of exercise science. And I was a trainer. That's probably some of the background that you saw there as I was a, uh, a trainer at a fit, uh, fit body bootcamp franchise out of West Michigan. Well, so happened that that West Michigan franchise was the fastest growing franchise in the entire country. And we had, when I started three locations, I believe across 12 or 13 employees. And by the time that I left, we had over 50 employees across eight locations, uh, multiple of those locations doing over a million dollars a year. And I was just so uh, enthralled by how we were growing so quickly and the scale that we were moving at and uh, all the people that we were attracting in our hiring process. And so I got really attracted into uh, like scaling businesses and more of like the operational side of things. And so I got to manage a facility uh, and learned a lot about the operations of, you know, a 50 person plus business. And it was uh, extremely rewarding to me because our CEO would uh, just give us a ton of time of his time. And then also would just give us resources on resource. I mean, I'm talking probably close to hundred thousand dollars a year that he would spend in uh, education for our team. And so I was able to learn pretty much anything that I wanted, even if it wasn't fitness related. And so I jumped into this world of ops and learning how to scale a business. Well, I had the opportunity to actually leave the fitness world back in 2018 and jump into one of my friend's marketing agencies that he just started. And it was a single man operation at the time. And he was like, Hey man, like I want to, you come on, start as my COO and, you know, help me grow this thing. And I was like, sweet, like, sounds like a really cool opportunity. Um, you know, it, it was new for me. It was a little scary, but jumped in and kind of learned as I went. And, uh, definitely was not deserving of the title of chief operating officer, but, um, you know, uh, I remember one of the first books that I bought was how to be a chief operating officer. And if you look today, there's like maybe one or two books on uh, being a chief operating officer. Like there's nothing out there. There's no literature. So I, I was just like trying to figure things out as I went. And, and a lot of like what I learned were from other entrepreneurs in the space and, and other great minds in the operational space. Well, kind of fast forward here a little bit. We scaled that, that agency uh, and we grew it to about uh, about $4 million in revenue uh, across 25 people, which was a, like a huge feat for us and was, you know, uh, a really, really cool milestone in my career. Uh, and then we underwent an acquisition back in December of 2020. And after that acquisition, I had the opportunity to step into what I'm doing now, which is actually consulting on operations and systems for digital marketing agencies. So I work with about 25, 30 different digital marketing agencies all across the world, anywhere from Australia to Europe here in the US. 
And uh, yeah, we help them scale their infrastructure and their operation and their teams. Um, we, we really take like a holistic view of the business. We like to get down in the trenches with these businesses, look at everything from, you know, the sales side to lead generation, to fulfillment, onboarding, offboarding, uh, churn rate, you know, pretty much the entire scope of the business, pretty broad, what we actually focus in on. And, uh, you know, and we help essentially scale agencies. So, and that kind of brings you up to speed to today. So it was a little long winded. Hopefully, hopefully that wasn't too boring. No, that wasn't. And, uh, you know, something my listeners probably don't know unless they did a little research on me. My friends and family certainly do because I put a lot of hours in it is I'm a mergers and acquisitions guy. That's what this podcast is. That's how to exit. Right. But, Mm -hmm. uh, in the grand scheme of things, and uh, I'm gonna just for the let's try this. In the grand scheme of things, um, I spend most of my days in a giant marketing rollout. Uh, for we hate that phrase, but for better, for for common phrases that people would know, sure. it's a marketing rollout. And um, but it's called the International Marketing Accelerator, and uh, we've been working on it for since uh, January, February is when we really got kicked off, and. Um, I just got off the phone today with a, uh, the, uh, I won't say who they are, but they're a holding company. They've been in business for a few years. They've acquired four uh, agencies and they're looking to do eight or nine by the time they're done. We've got 19 in due diligence. So, I mean, we're beautiful. Really, I, I speak to between four and six marketing agencies a day in the last 80, 90 days. When we started talking to them, I've actually been on the phone with uh, and talking to uh, in an acquisitions conversation, a mergers conversation. Uh, with probably over 100, 140, 150 agencies. So, and uh, there's some really unique stuff inside of them. A lot of them are million to $2 million, are kind of our, our bottom threshold is a $2 million agency. Uh, kind of top would be that's $25, $30 million. We probably, we could talk to somebody bigger than that, but that's just who, who we seem to be attracting. Mm-hmm. And uh, we built an advisory panel of people that have done it before. People who have grown global agencies um, and scaled them and sold them and uh, some of the, the top advisors of the world. So I'm interested in this conversation to talk about uh, the merger and acquisition side of it. Like, you know, what yeah. is that? Uh, without giving the name of the company acquired you or getting sure. you in trouble, anything you say, just let's like kind of what did that look like? Because one of the things that we set out to do at IMA, the Inter- International Marketing Accelerator, was to what we call, um, we call it democratizing wealth. We're disrupting the entire marketing agency model. We think that the traditional model of mergers and acquisitions in marketing is broken, mm. right? Usually what happens is a cool company like yours, you guys were working, you created, you, you spent blood, sweat, tears, and we like to add on years building this thing, right? And usually these the acquisition model looks something like they come in, they offer you anywhere from you know a few X to maybe six or seven, you know, uh, unless you have something really unique, they might go above that. They merge it together. They spend a few years, you know, doing some synergies and all their mergers, and then they sell it for full industry multiple, which is usually above a 10 or 11. So we jokingly say that, you know, these the mergers and acquisitions model, currently the traditional model is they buy you at wholesale and then they mm-hmm. sell you at retail, right? And uh, we've turned that upside down and we actually give our agency owners a chance to participate, they keep the majority stake in the entire process. So we take a minority stake from day one, and they get to participate in that liquidity event, you know, that we've got planned. I now I, I, I keep saying 36 months out, but now it's like 30 months left, right? So, uh, you know, so tell me a little bit about kind of how that process went, what did you like, and what did yeah. you like about the whole acquisitions? Sure, sure. Your agency? Yeah, I, I think like the first thing that kind of comes top of mind is like how little you actually know about business until you go under an acquisition, right? And start the due diligence process and, uh, you know, how, how you know, well-behaved you actually have to be in order to get a, a solid multiple on your business. Um, we were acquired by a venture capitalist firm and, and uh, it, it was a really cool opportunity at the time and, and uh, you know, to have some, some extra resources coming through the door and the ability to hire more people and scale our infrastructure. Um, you know, for us, I, I, to this day, I don't think it was the correct time to sell. Uh, I think we still had, um, more to prove on just like our profitability side, like, cause we self-funded our own scale. Um, you know, and so for us, I don't think we were in a position to necessarily sell yet. Uh, I just think, 
you know, for us, it was, it was attractive at the time. It's nice to hear, you know, numbers start coming out of the woodwork. I, I wish we would have played things a little bit more patiently uh, and, you know, heard a few more offers and had some time to, you know, increase our, our EBITDA. Cause you know, at the end of the day, we, we could have increased it, you know, uh, at least by a few points and, and, you know, allowed us to be in a, a better position for an acquisition. We could have sharpened a few more of our systems as well. Um, making sure that, uh, you know, whoever the acquiry was like, we could show them like, Hey, like every system within our, our agency is, you know, easily replaced by someone else, uh, if needed. Um, and so that's what I wish we would have done a little bit better things that we did extremely well is that our key players, uh, are like our C level team was very removed from the fulfillment and a majority of the decision-making happening on like the ground floor, like in the trenches. So we were able to, um, you know, allocate to our team, a lot of the fulfillment, a lot of the decision-making and, you know, our whole job, your, my job as the COO is just to make sure, Hey, you know, we, we're keeping tabs on all projects happening and that they deliverables get delivered on time and in a high quality fashion. And then on the CEO side, I mean, it, it's essentially what a CEO does. It's visionary and uh, it's, you know, making connections, getting in the right room, speaking on stage. And so we had the ability to also, you know, get him in a position where he wasn't, you know, in the day-to-day -day fulfilling. And that that's like the first step of like, if you ever want to undergo an acquisition, you have to start removing yourself from the day-to-day -day and the fulfillment side of things. And then eventually, once you're out of the fulfillment, you also need to start being okay with delegating decisions out, bring in some specialists, people that are extremely good at their position, whether that's a, you know, a chief financial officer, COO, um, chief marketing officer, you know, these people are going to be specialized in what they do and hopefully make higher level decisions than you could uh, within that position so that, you know, you can go and you can acquire, you know, more deals, more deal flow and be able to, you know, kind of be more of like the face of the brand and, and increase that multiple simply through you not having to be a part of it. Uh, that's what makes, uh, in my opinion, an agency very attractive to buy is that the owner, the person that founded it doesn't need to be there every day uh, and have their hand in the pot constantly. Like they can go and, and do some things that will help with the growth of the business. So it's interesting. We actually have a role inside of the mergers and acquisitions, like, you know, guys like me who buy and sell companies for a living is we don't buy ourselves another job. Right. Mm -hmm. And when yeah. we look at it, when we're going through the due diligence and we're looking for that, we are looking for, are the books clean? Do you have your, do you have your stuff in order? Mm -hmm. Right. And not just, did you get it in order over the last six months so that you can look good to an acquisitions guy? We go yeah. back three years. Right. So, you know, you know, and we don't mind that you went back and cleaned it up, but have you done the legwork to make everything right? So that, you know, for the last three years, everything, you know, correlates. And the other side of it is, is like who has to stay and who can go is really critical for us. Like we don't want to buy ourselves another job. Now I've seen, never seen an acquisition where the, like myself or somebody doesn't have to jump in for a little bit, but the whole point is the team should be there and able to run it. And, you know, the acquiring uh, partner or what do you want to call it? The, the company or person acquiring you, um, needs to be able to look at it and go, okay, this thing would run pretty well if I stayed out of it, maybe even better if I stayed out of the way. Right. right. And then, you know, how can we augment it, grow it, uh, acquire another company, bolt onto it? You know, uh, the things that we do, we want to focus on that instead of the things the company should already be good at doing, like what you're talking about, the systems, the processes, um, everything's documented, right? It's, uh, standard operating procedures. If somebody leaves, um, the next guy coming in doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. You know, the, the way that you've done it, the way that your customers expect it is documented and can be done. Um, side of your coaching business, you know, I really like this, that what you're doing. Do you have companies you're growing and like they're preparing them? Because in my mind, every company should always be, be, be preparing along the way. You're preparing to sell, even if you don't ever want to sell, yep. right? Yep. If you ran your business as if you're going to sell it someday, you would have a different business than if you just show up every day trying to make another dollar. Uh, yeah. your book would be clean. Your taxes would be well, uh, you could take more vacations, right? Sure. Uh, you wouldn't be handcuffed. And when or when an acquisition happens, when a guy like me comes and wants to talk to you, um, you'll have a less, you know, in the marketing world, I think the standard three to five years of an earnout. 
you know, yep. the only way to avoid the earn out is like, Hey, I haven't been in this company. I haven't been actively partaking in this company for the last 12 months. I go in one day a week, two days a week at most. Right. right? And this thing runs without me. That's the only way any, any person in their right mind acquiring a company wouldn't want the guy that created it to be there. Right. Exactly. So what inside of your current business and these agencies you're coaching and stuff, is that, is that a consideration? Like one of these days they might sell and you, here's the things you need to have in line just in case. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And, and um, you know, and, and that's one of the first things that we cover is like, Hey, like what are we building for exactly? Like our, I like guess the main goal to go under an acquisition and how you build, you know, uh, a lot of these successful agencies is going to be exactly like, um, like you were going to sell it. Um, now, some people do have other goals, like you were saying, like not everyone is going to sell. Um, I know a lot of agencies that are cash flowing for just bigger and better opportunities. Like they're taking their agency and they're taking the profit that they're making from that and investing into e-commerce and bringing on their own e-commerce brands. Now they have an internal portfolio. Their marketing team can support that e-commerce portfolio with their marketing team. And now it's like they have an all in-house shop, um, you know, in, in, you know, with their business. So, you know, I've seen those things happen and, and I think you can do things a little bit differently if that's the the strategy. Um, I, I think there's the ability to bring on like things like more contractors and, um, you know, kind of play things a little bit uh, uh, tighter when it comes to the finances of the business. Like you can become more profitable by, you know, not bringing on full-time employees and, and, and staffing, you know, your entire agency ahead of time to, uh, you know, kind of get it to a point of like, hey, like we're just trying to get to this point in cash flow and this point in profitability, so we can take that profit and go apply it somewhere else. Uh, whether that's you know, e-commerce, real estate, whatever it is that you know your heart desires when it comes to your next venture. But um, for the most part, yes, hundred percent. Like you should be building this thing like you're going to sell it. And I think that everything we're saying here for anybody out there running a business it applies to any business, mm -hmm. right? I don't care if you run a donut shop or you run a marketing agency, um, the same principles apply, right? Uh, run it like you're going to sell it someday. And if you ever need to, you're ready to go. Yep. Uh, so uh, inside of the marketing, and, and I think you, know, you refer to like digital marketing, um, like what do you see right now? And I, I've got a pretty good scope of this. I've talked, like I said, I've, yeah. Been an hour on the phone with you know, at least 140 agencies, at least mm -hmm. uh, over the last eight, you know, probably 75, 80 days. I've been probably, I think I've been saying 70, 70 days for about 10, 10 days now. So probably closer to 80 days. <laughs> you get caught up into it. I bet if I looked at it, it's 85 or something. But yeah. um, if you, uh, since the end of July, early August, I've been talking to agencies. I've, I've got a stack literally of notes on my desk that's like that thick, right? Yep. And uh, I'm old. Uh, I'll be 50 soon. So uh, I still take notes on paper and then I transfer them into the computer later. I can write faster than I can type. Uh, so uh, I've yeah, got a great, I've got a great, I, I've got a great system for you that will digitalize everything instantly. It'd be, yeah. it'd be beautiful for you. Yeah. I use Otter, but uh, man, I still have to go back and translate what Otter thinks I said. <laughs> sure. So uh, uh, anyway, um, and I, uh, that's not a plug for them. Uh, anyway. Um, so inside of that, what do you see as the biggest obstacles of growth for most of the agencies that you come into play with? Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, I think the, the days of, um, you know, like single channel marketers is kind of, kind of gone. Um, you know, Facebook used to be this place where anyone could jump in and, and be an awesome Facebook marketer, you know, uh, just throw some campaigns together, uh, pull a couple of levers and then let Facebook do its thing. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. Um, yeah, those days are, those days are pretty much gone now. So, um, uh, I've seen a lot of agencies adapting into like a more full service model where, you know, they're, they're doing multiple channels and mitigating spend across a lot of different channels. They're tapping into more owned audiences like email and, um, you know, SMS has been really hot for a few of my clients recently. There's a couple of really cool softwares out there um, that are popping on the scene for SMS. So um, I see people starting to mitigate spend more. Um, the top agencies that I've seen um, like more on like the paid side of, uh, of getting more acquisition done is they're operating off of a P and L, which is how it probably should have been done this entire time. Instead of using the attribution from, you know, say, you know, Google or, uh, you know, Facebook, uh, they're tapping into more of like a holistic view of the entire business itself. They're not just looking at, you know, 
you know, what's coming in from Facebook and what's coming in from Google. They're looking at the entire PL and they're making decisions off the company's PL. And they're looking at, you know, cogs and they're looking at uh, distribution and they're taking a almost like a, a more in depth look of like they're like a fractional chief marketing officer. Um, and the ones that are doing that are winning tremendously right now because they're getting better results. They have a better understanding of how the business is running and they can give better recommendations based off seeing the entire piece of the pie, not just a slice of it. It's interesting to see a lot of agencies I talk to who have built out a, what I call a strategic arm. They actually do some strategic consulting instead of marketing, not mm-hmm. just the, like the message, the brand and everything, but strategically how to put things together and all, you know, from search, from strategy all the way down to the, like most of the time, if you think of marketing, it's the tactical side of it, right? You, you take ads, you put it out there, you measure results, you, you twist it until you get the results and the return on investment that you want. And, you know, those are all kind of tactics and tactical side. There's a lot of agencies right now that are building out a strategic, almost consultancies mm-hmm. inside of their, uh, their agencies. They, they, they look for things that are, you know, brands that are broken, brands that are fading and, um, you know, come up with strategies to re- you know, revive them, re- you know, regrow them. And, uh, but one of the things I'm seeing across, you know, all these agencies that we start looking at what are their barriers to growth? I think right now, and this might be just a thing in the last 12 months or so, because I, like I said, we just started talking to them about 80, 90 days ago. Um, one of the things I'm seeing is like the number one thing, and it's, this this would shock you, uh, shock me if you'd have, if you'd have told me this prior to uh, this whole process. My master's degree is in marketing, but um, I have an MBA in marketing. But if you'd have told a guy with an MBA in marketing that these two are the top top two things, I'd have shaken my head. It's like no way because they're marketing companies, right? Mm-hmm. The first one is hiring and retaining great talent, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Their marketing, you know, their marketing companies, you know, my assumption would be they could go out and market and cause people to want, you know, want to be part of what they do and cause people not to knock on the door and like, you know, then they could just sort them out. But it's not so. They're so busy working on their client stuff. It's the old cobblers need shoes, right? Uh, the painter needs to paint his house. Uh, I grew up, my father was a painter. Our house seemed to always need a coat of paint. We always were out painting somebody else's. Yeah. Um, that said, the other side of it is, you know, this one would shock you, shock me even more is lead generation. Mm-hmm. Almost, and there's a study that we actually downloaded and we're looking at. And uh, I think the study was like less than 10%. It was almost like it was five or 6% or maybe even less than that of all agencies get their next clients through marketing. Mm-hmm. Almost 80 to 85% of it's referrals <clears throat> from, you know, existing yeah. clients and clients they've had when, you know, when they move from one agency to another, they took clients with them and stuff yeah. like that. So, and but you know. I think part of that is is it's an oversaturated market. Uh, you have a lot of people coming in and saying that they're marketers, and uh, unfortunately, they're just not right. And so, uh, lead generation becomes an issue for bad marketers. Unfortunately, you know, it's like uh, because on when you're a bad marketer, you lose clients just as fast as you sign them. So, it, your entire thought process goes back to, well, I need more leads. When in fact, you know you are actually, your issue is that you're not getting the results for your clients that, that you need to be getting them. And so your, your bucket is leaking and your clients are exiting just as fast as you're signing them. And so the thought there, and and this is what I deal with, with a lot of my agencies that are just kind of like getting some traction or just getting started is that like, oh yeah, like I'm having such a hard time getting leads. And it's like, well, how many leads are you getting? Oh, well, you know, I'm taking, you know, 20 leads. I'm taking from those, maybe like five sales calls. I'm like, okay, so how many of those are you landing? Well, I'm landing about two of them. That's well, fantastic. Like two new clients per month. Like you think kind of industry standard, like roughly around $4,500, 5K uh, per month on, on average retainers. Um, you guys are should be a very quickly growing agency, like pretty healthy. Uh, and so when that's the case and you're not seeing growth, there's other problems at hand, right? And a lot of those stem back to, one, we're not getting the results or two, the client, the client experience is, is just not very good between onboarding or um, communication, whatever it is. Uh, and so that's where, you know, you have to go and probe in on what the actual problem is. Um, you know, I know a lot of people complain about lead gen, but I refuse to believe that it's the actual problem. It's interesting because uh, like, it's, you know, we've, we've talked to quite a few and of the ones that say lead gen, 
I don't see a correlation in their customer retention. Like we really? I'm not talking about, you know, I'm talking about first and second calls where we haven't done their financial due diligence. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much hot, hot air they're blowing. Sure. <laughs> right. But from the conversations, they're still claiming 90, 95%, you know, retention rate. But I think that to put some color or some scope around mm -hmm. the conversation, when I talk to them, what are their barriers to growth? We expect agencies that come to be part of our international accelerator with our assistance, with cross-selling, upselling, with the 30 or 40 agencies, maybe 50 agencies we bring on board, we expect them to double or triple their revenue, their, their current trajectory. So they, you know, double or triple that uh, during, our pro during our process over the next what's left of 30 months, right? So when we talk, it's inside of that scope is like, if we were able to double or triple you, you know, a lot of the guys come back and go, I'd need more leads, right? The referrals would yeah. not, not let me grow that fast. And, uh, and I was like, I don't think they get the fact that, you know, we're going to have 45, you know, 50, 60 other agencies that don't necessarily do what they do that are cross-selling and upselling their services. Sure. So those are almost referrals, right? Yeah. Uh, to some extent, but, uh, you know, if you look at these agencies, they don't actually, what I'm saying is they don't actually have a plan where they go out and do lead gen. Right. Um, yeah. And, and, and I think, it, good. I mean, these guys have people, there's a lot of these guys, like we turn away more business than we take on, right? Cause the, sure. the roadblock to growth to them is highly trained staff that can deliver at the level of quality that they want to continue to deliver at. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they have to, you know, I was talking to a guy the other day and he said, well, they turn, you know, they get about 10 proposals, you know, they get 10 conversations, uh, you know, about every two weeks. So about 20 a month, 25 a month. And I said, well, how many new clients did you take on? He says about three. And I said, okay, so what's wrong with the other, you know, 22. And he said, well, 70% of those, they just don't qualify to be like, they're not, they're not yeah. what our, our target, right? They just, right. they're, they have issues on their own, right? And it's just a, not a fit. It's maybe not a cultural fit. Maybe their product's not of quality. Maybe they're doing something these guys don't want to be involved in. And I said, well, okay, now we're still looking at, you know, a few few of them there. What about those guys? He goes, we have to cherry pick them because I don't have enough people to, to, to service everybody that wants our service, right? Yeah. So, yeah, but, there's, there's yeah. definitely a massive, like, uh, talent pool shortage right now in the marketing space. There's, there's a lot of people... Um, that are, are, you know, uh, not quite ready for that next level of, of coming on to like a, a, a very talented marketing, uh, team. That's why you're seeing a lot of these acquisitions and roll-ups, like even in, in, uh, other agencies acquiring, uh, smaller agencies just simply for the talent, nothing to do with, you know, necessarily the client pool that they have or, uh, or their systems. It's quite literally just to acquire the, the people within that business, you know? That's so common. They have a nickname for it. Is it AccuQuire or something like that? Like yeah, AccuQuire. Yep. Like, yeah, they're just acquiring for talent. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at the big guys, like, you know, the big companies out there, not necessarily marketing companies, but big ones like Google's and Apple, a lot of times they're just, they're acquiring purely for the talent. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, the, the talent pool is, is difficult right now. That's, that's one of the biggest barriers to scale for a lot of agencies is finding the right people. Uh, and I always tell people like, you, you gotta, you gotta get a little salesy sometimes. Like, utilize your LinkedIn network. Uh, you can, you can, uh, poach some, some people and it, it kind of sounds dirty, but, um, I mean, th there's a lot of people working for fast growing agencies that just aren't getting an awesome experience. And if you can deliver an awesome experience for them, um, you should feel kind of like vindicated to, to go and get those people. Uh, I think that's okay. In my opinion. I don't think it's shady at all. I think that the really great people already have jobs, right? Mm -hmm. I, yep. uh, I, I rarely, would bring on somebody or hire anybody who sends me a resume that's unemployed. Right. Yeah. I, uh, I've, I've made some of my best hires out of category and totally from somebody else. Like one of the best, I was in the it world for a long time. I told you that already, but, uh, um, one of the guy, uh, one of the ladies, uh, I won't say her name cause she might be listening to this. She, she listens <laughs> to some of this stuff, but, uh, she was a sh uh, shoe salesman. It'd be all of all things. I was at a, I was, uh, trying, I was teaching martial arts back then. I was a much skinnier guy and I was looking, uh, uh, for some wrestling shoes to, to use on the mat. Try, don't wanted to try them out. Uh, anyway, this, this lady, she, uh, had a difficult customer and mm -hmm. the customer was just like kind of a prima donna, just like, you know, wanted to be, 
uh, like concierge service. And this is like a footlocker or something. It wasn't like a high end shoe store. Right. I was, I was going to get wrestling shoes Yeah, <laughs> and she handled it so well. I basically said, Hey, come here. And she says, what, what kind of shoes do you need? And I was like, I don't need wrestling shoes, but I already picked them out. I want to chat with you about something else. And she's like, well, what is, you know, what do you want to chat with me about? I said, you're in Silicon Valley. What is it you want to do? And, uh, she says, well, I eventually want to learn to program. I'm thinking about going to college for it. I said, well, do you know who excite.com is? And she's like, well, yeah, it's a big you know, website portal. I said, well, you, if you want a job, you've got one. Here's my card. Call me tomorrow. You can start on Monday. So wow. My, my guys will teach you how to, will teach you how to code. Right. It might take us a little while to get you around to it, but you know, she was one of the best administrative assistants. And, you know, I had a lot of you know, Oracle database administrators and some other guys that, I mean, they make more money than you do as the director of operations, right? Sure. And then, uh, but they're prima donnas. Like they, you know, they come in when they want to come in, they go home when they want to go home and you got to keep them because nobody else can do their job. She was amazing with those people. It was the best hire I ever did. So I still am a big believer that you can, if you learn to spot talent, even as, when it's out of category, you can teach somebody a skill, but you can't teach them the soft talents, the, mm. the, the talents of de dealing, the personality of dealing with difficult people, mm -hmm. the personality of just being natural at good, good human service. I like to call it good, you know, good, just good being good with people who are being difficult to you. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't I think it's shady or scammy at all to, 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 to pluck people. I have a friend who has oh, a yeah. what you call it, ink fastest growing 500, whatever they call that. Yeah, he has ink a, 500. He has a, a head hunting company. That's what they do. It's oil okay. and gas. Years. And they don't, they don't look for resumes. They look for people that are already happy at one yeah. company and they pluck them from them and move them to another. They'll, cold, they'll actually reach out and cold call an engineer, you know, an oil wow. and gas engineer and say, hey, well, you know, are you open to new opportunities? But that's where the greatest people are actually employed, right? Yep, hundred uh, percent. Yeah, one of, one of my favorite tactics was just you know dropping in someone's DMs um, on LinkedIn and not necessarily like, hey, are you open to opportunities? But like, I'd always just say, uh, hey, like you know, uh, our agency is currently staffing. If you know of anyone, uh, you know, you know, uh, send send them send them this link, you know. And it's like I'm not directly saying it to them, but it's like here you go, like. We we'll, do that. We'll subtlety. <laughs> <laughs> you probably got one of those. Uh, you're in the marketing space. You might have got one of those messages from me. It's like, hey, I'm a founder of an investment company. We're looking <laughs> for marketing companies. You know, are you interested in talking to you know mergers and acquisitions? You know, investment group. You know, we're yeah. doing something really unique. And or do you know anybody that you know? We do send out messages. Do you know anybody that has an agency that's doing over two million dollars a year? And you're like, well, I do. Like, well, do yeah. you know? Are you are you world class? Like, are you really good at anything inside of it? You know, <laughs> We know they're, we were looking for them to self-identify. Right? Yeah, ex exactly. I love that. Yeah. So um, I, I asked you a lot of questions. And you know, one of the things, my favorite questions to ask is like, after everything we've talked to and you know, the questions I've asked you, what should I have asked, right? Well, what should agency owner, and this is for agency owners and any business yeah. owner, uh, what should they know? I, you know, what did I miss? Yeah, man, that's, that's a good question. Um, you know, uh, I think, most of the time, um, you know, when it comes to quick, quick growing businesses and, 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 uh, especially agencies, you know, you're in the people business, right. And so, um, you need to really ask a lot of questions around the type of people that are in your organization and, uh, making sure that the team is in alignment with the culture and the vision of where you want to go. And oftentimes, you know, agencies are so fast moving and, you know, we, we just, we go, we go and work. And uh, like, I'm sure you remember in the agency space, it's like your day is done like that. It's a snap of a finger. And, and it is, there are no long, in, in my opinion, there are no long, I never had a long day in the agency space. It was just flying by. Uh, and so with that being said, oftentimes vision and culture will get pushed to the side. And sometimes people get pushed to the side. And when you are operating a people business, you need to keep people top of mind. I get that. I believe that. So what is the other, uh, another question I have in kind of that same realm is, are there any preconceived notions that are common in the marketplace uh, that just bug you, right? That there's a common belief about something in the, you know, and for your, for your case, the mergers and acquisitions of agencies, or even just the growth of digital agencies, is there some common belief out there that, 
is an absolute total fallacy you wish would go away. Yeah, um, you know, uh, I think there's a certain persona that uh, agency owners feel they need to fulfill on um, of they look a certain way or they drive certain cars or they need to spend an X amount of dollars uh, in order to impress someone in like the private jet life. And like, and don't get me wrong, like it's cool, it's fun. And if you can afford it, awesome, go for it. But that doesn't, that's not what's going to make you a great marketer. That's not what's going to help you build a great team and a great culture or build a strong business. Like um, if you can, you know, kind of wait on some of those things, you can put your, you can put your business in, in a really healthy position to get acquired and get acquired for a very high multiple. If, if you're a little bit more frugal and like I said, you know, I'm not talking like cut your Starbucks coffee out and, and, you know, don't get the subscription to Netflix. And like, that's not, that's not what we're talking about here. I'm talking about like, you know, really overdoing it and, and, you know, having expenses at the detriment of the business. Right. It's interesting is, uh, I think it was one of Dan Sullivan's books or something. I, I read a lot of stuff, but uh, he, he refers to like money in an interesting way. He says, most people, when they tell you they want to be a millionaire, they really don't want to be a millionaire. They want to spend a million dollars, right? They want yeah. to own the things a million dollars will buy. And I I've love that. I'm stealing that. <laughs> right? That's, so, that's he, so good. Yeah, I, I've seen some of, that, some of that with the smaller agencies. I've seen one of the agencies, he cleared his first, you know, like, net profit of well over a million dollars, you know, but not quite two. But, and I, we asked him, I was like, well, what did you do? Well, I bought this and I, he spent a million, but he basically paid himself a million dollars because he's never been able to do that. And I was like, okay, well, first of all, that's not how businesses are run. Right. Yeah. As you know, and that's going to hurt you in the long run. You, you had a windfall and you could just, you could have cascaded that into so much more, but it's true. A lot of people, and I, and I have a background in real estate investment and I, I mentor, I had a guy text me today, asked me if I'd privately mentor him in real estate. And uh, he's, I don't do that anymore, but he's have a high enough clack caliber. I might talk to, I'm going to talk to him and see what it is he wants. Yeah. It, you know, it's three to five grand a month for my time, but if he really wants to do it and he's, you know, and he's going to get the work done, I, I'll talk to him. Um, but that said, most of the people that get in there, there's, I'm actually, you know, I've been working on a book forever. I, I keep needing to finish it up. It's called Get Rich, Get, Get Rich Quick My Ass. <laughs> and uh, it's about the fallacies inside of the real estate space. A lot of these guys come in and like, they think they're going to make a million dollars in their first two years. And some people do. Like if you can get in and create systems, processes and churn a bunch of properties out, you can do it. I've seen it done. I've mentored people that blew past me. And like, you know, one of the, one of the guys I mentored here in town is probably the, in the top five investors in the state now, you know, flips houses, all of that. You've got over 200 properties, you know, uh, as far as like individually houses he owns mm -hmm. and uh, flips 10 or 15 at a time, you know, but uh, so it is possible, but it's, I honestly think there's a huge fallacy in this um, get rich quick or, you mm -hmm. know, overnight success. Right. Yeah. Um, yep. uh, so anyway, uh, I think I'm running close to your time here. I think we, you said you had something right after the top of the hour. I, I, I do. Cool. Yeah. At 11 15, I, I have a, a, a meeting. So cool. So let's just wrap this up. Is there any final words? How do people get a hold of you? Like, uh, how do they reach out and, and, and find yeah. you and how to get a hold of you? Yes. Uh, social media is a great, great place. Um, you know, LinkedIn, great place to reach me, uh, Facebook, Instagram. Um, and, uh, uh, you can find me at my Instagram is at Joshi Kobayashi and I can, I can send that to you. You can, you can plug it in somewhere if you need to. Uh, but yeah, it, or you can, you know, uh, get on a strategy call with me through our website. i um, happy to talk shop and uh, you know, uh, help, help get you guys in the, in the first initial direction if needed. So um, yeah, what, whatever works the URL for the, for the listeners. Yeah. So uh, three, two, one pocket ops.com. Okay. So if you want to get a hold of Joshua here, you uh, can find him on social media. Uh, there's quite a few jo Joshua Johnstons on uh, a LinkedIn, but if you look for 321 Pocket Ops, yep. uh, you can find him pretty quickly. And then you know, go to 321pocketops.com. Uh, you can reach out to him, schedule a, a, consul a consultation call or a, or a free uh, coaching call or whatever you want to call yep. them. And uh, that's how you get a hold of him. And uh, thank you, Josh, for being here. Yeah, thank you, man. I, I, one of my favorite conversations I've had on a podcast so far, so I appreciate it. I enjoy this. I should do more of it. The Investors and Entrepreneurs Professional Mastermind. 
The Investors and Entrepreneur Professional Mastermind combines the traditional peer-to-peer mastermind introduced first in Napoleon Hill's famous book, Think and Grow Rich, with accountability partnering where your peers help you ensure that you set goals, take actions, and get results. If you want to scale, blow past roadblocks, and achieve success faster than you might think is possible, I suggest you take a visit over to TIEPM.com. That's T I E. PM.com and check out the Investors and Entrepreneurs Professional Mastermind.